Hi all, and welcome to Philosophy, the podcast where I talk about whatever I like. Today, I am beginning again on uh, season two, so I'm really, really excited to get started with a new painting. You may have noticed, if you're looking at this on YouTube, um, there is a bit of paint on the canvas right now because I did just start this, and I realised I've kind of forgotten how to do this and how this goes because I was being massively incoherent, I think, and not doing a good job of explaining what I was trying to explain or putting my thoughts in order. Um, so I, yeah, I struggled with this a bit. So I'm, I'm just going to try and retake the beginning and re-express what I was trying to say and um, where I'm where I'm going with things. Um, basically, over the last few months, I've been thinking a lot about why I feel the way I do or why I think the way I do or why I behave the way I do, which kind of works out right because it's the theme of this podcast. Um, but something I've been thinking about a lot is kind of my childhood and um, certain sort of beliefs or thoughts that I might have consolidated as a child and how they may be a bit more maladaptive now that I am older. Um, these can be things that have been explicitly said to me or kind of impressions of what has been said to me, but things that have basically been kind of repeated or ingrained in a way that now as an adult, they are in the way of me living a happy life and they get in the way of me functioning in society properly. And um, sometimes they lead to me kind of overreacting to things or having kind of intense negative emotions. So they affect, I think, my experience of the world. So I thought I wanted to kind of think about these for a while. And on this journey of trying to kind of uncover um, what are the things that I think about myself, I was reading this book and it had a line in it which really, really resonated with me. Um, I'm going to read it out word for word because it said, um, there is this crazy making message. The real me is ugly, but I'm supposed to fake it in the real world. I still don't get it. Um, and it really, really resonated with me a lot. So I think this is something that I wanted to unpack today. Um, you'll notice that the painting is a lot smaller. And the reason for that is that the original source photograph um, was quite grainy, so I didn't have a lot of detail. And I worried that by picking a large canvas, um, it would not have a lot of detail on it. So I'll be working on a smaller canvas for this. So I'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, <laughs> hopefully I've decided to do one season for each painting. So this might be quite a short season potentially, but let's see. Anyways, um, yeah, I've, I've already mixed my paints um, because I've started and uh, I'm using this kind of like greyish beige colour here. Um, that's what I'm working on with some of the details in the shadows so far. So the reason I wanted to touch upon this today was that this, this message of you're not acceptable, you're not okay, you're not enough, but you need to pretend you are, um, is something that I think is quite core to the way that I see the world and um, the way that I have at least interpreted my upbringing. And I think now as an adult, that's not the best thing. And I, I've, I've tried to kind of unpack it and see where it potentially comes from and why it might be damaging. But I think it's it's interesting because when we're younger, we are told to change so much. Um, so we are told to um, lose our baby voice, for example. So don't don't be cute. Um, like speak properly, speak like an adult. Um, that's one 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 place where these things start. Um, sit differently. Don't don't sit like that. Don't lie down on a table. Don't lie down on a chair. That's that's rude. That's impolite. Um, just like sit up properly and um, you know look at people properly in the eye when you're speaking. Um, don't laugh so loud. Loud. You sound very crass. Um, just talk differently, speak differently, look differently, stand differently, um, kind of express yourself differently, don't be so outspoken. And all of these th things that we are told potentially under um, the guise of good manners, right? Everyone wants a very good manner child. Um, so we have this, we make these attempts, I think, or attempts are made on us to kind of tame us and make us polite and potentially seem um, I don't know, a bit more high status or a bit more um, well-educated and well-mannered also because it does reflect positively on parents uh, for whatever reason when their children are kind of well-behaved and adult-like when they are younger, which is very problematic in many ways. Um, but I think this constant view of being told to change, isn't it the same thing as 
internalizing the thought of not being good enough the way you are. Like, can we tell someone, even if, if, if someone told you to constantly change things about yourself, like, oh, you should do your hair differently. Oh, you should um, dress differently. You should do this. You should do that. If someone was constantly telling this us, th- telling these things to us, wouldn't that also kind of mean that there's something wrong with the way you are? The way that you are is not good enough. It's not acceptable enough. And I think part of being a child or a huge part of being a child is being told to change. (laughs) A huge part of being a child is being told to kind of behave in a different way um, and being praised for not doing things as they come naturally to you, but doing things the way that you are told. So isn't that crazy? Just, just, I don't know. I I found that very, very mind blowing when I went, wait, like the the whole experience of being a child is internalising. The the better you are at internalising the thought of I can pretend to be different. I can pretend to be the way that they want me to be. I can stop these things that I'm naturally doing. The more you will get praised for it um, by the people that you care about the most as a child, which are your parents, and the better you will be um, in a way. And isn't that just insane? So I think the good children, I was a good child, as in I kind of um, did what I was told. And I was very, very good at internalizing this and like behaving the way that I was expected to behave and not rebelling and doing all these things. Doesn't that also then mean that I was very good at internalizing the thoughts of not being good enough? I, I don't know if this makes sense for anyone else, but it just kind of, it blew my mind a bit because I thought, well, this is where this all comes from in a way. This all comes from the thought of um, not, not, being good enough and wanting to change. And I wonder if we're good at this message and if we're particularly good at wanting to become different, if we're particularly good at self-improvement, if we're particularly good at productivity, if we're particularly good at going, this needs to be a different way and I can make that happen, doesn't that mean that we're also so familiar with the thought of I'm not okay the way I am? Because I remember those children when we were younger in school, the rebellious ones, the ones that I would go, oh my gosh, I can't believe they said that. The ones that would kind of question teachers, the ones that would question the improvements that they needed to make and go, no, I I, I don't want to do that. Why should I do that? I think those children actually had a stronger sense of self and a stronger sense of identity. And they felt that they were being told that they weren't good enough and they weren't going to sit for that. While for me, it was always very, very easy to go, this should be done this way. You should change this. This is not good enough. I go, okay, sure. Like I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that. I'll do that. Um, and this is not to say that I think that we should, you know, have wild children and let ourselves just do what we naturally want to do, whatever that might be in the moment. And, you know, never, ever um, take things seriously and never try to improve. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that if we accept that a lot of the self-talk that we have around ourselves and a lot of the things that we are told when we are younger is kind of has this implied message of not being good enough, then when do we give ourselves a break? Like, <laughs> genuinely, when when is it okay to be yourself? Um, as a child, when was it okay for you to behave the way that you wanted to behave? When was it okay for you to be loud? When was it okay for you to laugh in a crazy manner? When was it okay... Um, when were you accepted? And I hope you, I genuinely hope everyone was um, at some point. When were you accepted the way that you are um, unconditionally? And when were you told that you were good enough? Because I think those are, at least for me, hard kind of memories to come by. Um, And I wonder if they are then at the root of this kind of, (laughs) this sort of tendency. And, And then I wonder if like th- that that moment, that moment of acceptance and that moment of being able to be in the in the present to not want to improve for the future, um, if at the root, the never being, having been in that place when you were younger um, or constantly wanting to live up to something when you were younger, perhaps that takes away from your ability to ever be in the present, to ever be satisfied with what you have, to ever, to ever accept what you have and to ever... Um, be happy with what you have and like all we ever have is what we have right now right I'm not to get too philosophical here but like all we really have is the present but I think that this um, 
internalize change. And, and if you want something to change, it's always a future event. Um, you always want things to be different in a moment that is not what they are right now. So you always want things to change in the future. And therefore this very future looking, this very productivity seeking, this very improvement, self-improvement, change seeking behavior, I think can be highly internalized um, as a child and make things, I think, quite quite difficult for you to not have a voice that is not incredibly self-critical in your mind um, and not to have an incredibly negative opinion of yourself. On this note, I was then thinking, well, you know, let, let's take the extreme then. Um, if I'm, if we accept the fact or if I accept the fact that I'm actually very good at this um, kind of change this change mindset, this improvement mindset, this productivity seeking. Um, if I'm, if I'm very, very, if I never question the thought of I need to be different, and if I never question the thought of I could be better, I should be better. Um, if I never question that, if that's a very familiar feeling in my mind of you should change and yeah, and, 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 and accepting that almost, you know, instinctively and immediately, then what would happen if I was the way that I am forever? Um, <laughs> what would happen if I never looked better, if I never was fitter, if I never was skinnier, um, if I never was more knowledgeable, if I never was more acceptable by society, if I never was richer, if I if I could somehow, and I, I know this is a dangerous thought and I don't promote, a, a lot of the work that I do with myself is kind of accepting change and the only constant in the world is change and things will never stay the same. But worst case scenario, in terms of quality, whatever that stands for. And in terms of kind of my impression of myself or in terms of things that are semi-quantifiable, like you know, richness and status in terms of where you stand in kind of the economy and in your job, what if that never got better? Then how how would I feel about myself? I think accepting the fact that if it's up to me, I don't think I'd be too sad. I don't think I would mind too much if I had, you know, the same paint and I was just creating things again and again. And if I never was, you know, a consultant doctor or if I never was a, you know, really big YouTuber, would I care? Probably not. Like probably Elizabeth herself, she she, she couldn't care less. Um, I think I'm, I think I don't realise that I'm quite, I could be very easily satisfied with already what I have and I already have more than I than I need and I wondered then if why then I'm I don't think that I'm good enough if that is the case and I don't know if that made sense to anyone else um and I don't know if I'm being coherent enough I know that when I start these podcasts after a break I tend to be quite um I tend to be quite incoherent and flustered but that was what I was thinking about recently I was thinking a lot about this internalized self-doubt and I think it something else that that came out of it for me was the the view of there's almost six people in any interaction between two people and what I mean by that is there is who I really am so the internal me the subconscious me the um the the me that has the genuine needs and desires and that I don't always have access to so that, that's one person um, there is the me that I'm consciously trying to be, um, either the me that I'm tr consciously trying to turn into or the me that I'm consciously trying to portray in front of someone else. Um, and then there's the me that the other person thinks that I am, the impression they have of me. And then there is the other person's true self. There is the other person's person that they're trying to portray to me. And then there's my impression of them. So there's like six different people in every interaction. And Everything that then is said or communicated or discussed comes from one of these six different people. Some of them are my true self. Some of them are the self I'm trying to be. Some of them are the self that someone else is, thinks I am and is reading. And it must be therefore so tiring to have six different people in every interaction. And I wonder how we could minimize this. Um, I wonder why we have this like overly complex kind of combination of people. And I think sometimes in places like 
family or whenever you are very, very close, like very close friends, I think it's easy to let go of a few of these and your true self and the self that you're trying to portray come very, very close to one another. And I wonder if we can just bring this down to four at the very least, if there could be me and the person's impression of me and the other person and my impression of them. And if we could just communicate with these four without adding the person that I want to be perceived as and them adding the person that they want to be perceived as, I think it would make communication a lot easier. I don't know if that made any sense. Um, It definitely kind of makes sense to me um, in the way that I'm like, oh yeah, I know there, there is an Elizabeth I'm trying to come across as and there must be an Elizabeth that they think I am. And therefore, there must be these interactions between these six people every time that we talk and every time that we try to negotiate things and every time we try to discuss things and how exhausting and unnecessary is all of that and how can we get rid of it um so yeah I think I'm going to wrap up this first episode on this and um I do apologize for it being not the most coherent thing in the world as in I think the main message that I was trying to get across is that by being told to change and improve so much when you're younger, by being told to behave differently and look differently and speak differently and by being told to kind of conform so much, we are also at least internalizing, if not being explicitly told that we are not good enough the way that we are. And this is not to say that we should therefore become like a completely rebellious society who kind of does everyone does whatever they feel like without considering others and without rules and without norms and without culture that's not what I'm trying to say but I'm trying to say that there should be therefore at least a recognizing of this is the message perhaps that we are giving children and this is the message perhaps that we are internalizing or these are perhaps the messages that we've internalized as adults and I think ask ourselves just how how easy does self-improvement come to you? Do you have a step between being told to be better either by yourself or by other people where you go, actually, I don't know that I need to change or actually I'm happy the way that I am. Does this step exist for you? Because it definitely doesn't exist for me. If I, if I even hear that there's an opportunity for me to like improve in some way by a book that I want to read, or if there's a degree that I can do, or if there is kind of a, a level that I can improve on in things, I will take it. I will do it. I will immediately kind of throw away. I will never stand up for myself to go like, Elizabeth, you don't need this. You're okay. No, 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 no. no. I will go straight in. I go, yeah, sign me up. I'll do it. I'll improve. I'll be better. Tell me what I need to do. Um, (laughs) Tell me how I can do this. And I wonder therefore, if this is kind of toxic, if if this whole productivity thing is is kind of kind of stems from this need and desire to be different from what we are this complete neglect of acceptance for who we are and our value as people and our satisfaction with what we already have potentially are we completely just ignoring this throwing it away never never accepting it um do we have even if we and i don't think we should never be productive and we should never want to change absolutely that is so much fun i love doing it but do we recognize that we need a break from that do we do you have a space in a day or in the week or in every hour potentially where you take a breath and go i'm fine the way i am because i i, I don't um <laughs> i don't do we compensate for the more productive we are perhaps the more kind of space we also need to accept ourselves the way that we are the more we want to change the more self-love we need to have um the more that we are getting messages or we are in environments that kind of trigger a need for change a need for improvement the more we compensate by kind of giving ourselves love and acceptance for the things that we don't want to change the more we recognize the parts of us that are that are actually good that the, the way they are and that don't need um that don't need drastic and immediate and constant improvement um so yeah and I'm not a parent but I often kind of wonder how difficult it must be to navigate this with children and how um I I try to think how I would have wanted um to be treated differently potentially when I was younger um and then I think well do you do that for yourself right now (laughs) because I think that yes I would have loved to be told that I'm okay the way that I am um and that these changes are choices that I can make. Um, 
and I would have loved to know have known the reasons and be able to think critically and evaluate the reasons and make decisions on whether I want things to change in in certain ways and then as I think that I realize that I don't still give myself that benefit as an adult so I think that's something that I want to do more, more of is kind of add a step in between recognizing something in the world that makes me feel that I need to change which I'm very attuned to I'm very attuned to my incompetences I'm very attuned to ways that I can improve very 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 toxically attuned it's just music to my ears it just reaffirms this core belief of mine that I'm not good enough every time that there's an opportunity for me to improve it just rings that bell where I go like hell yes yes that's me I need this I need to be better um I'm just so horrible the way that I am I need to be better right now give it to me um and I wonder if that kind of needs turning down a bit. Um, because as I said, if, if, if the worst case scenario, I were to never, ever, ever, ever improve in my life, which kind of fills me with a dread and a, a fear like nothing else. Actually, if I do think, sit down and think about it, that's no big loss. That is absolutely no big loss for me. And um, keeping that in mind, therefore, it should be possible and acceptable for me not to constantly strive for improvement but be semi-satisfied with what I have so yeah um I think I'm going to pause this here especially because I'm running out of this color so I'll need to make some more of it and um yeah thank you so much for joining me for this chaotic first episode and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day be kind to yourself and others and don't believe everything you think thanks bye